What's up guys? It's Kelsey and I'm here with the cat. everyone, um, it's Kelsey Kuykendall and this is Cad Calls with Kelsey. Today we're talking with artist Chris Truman. Chris is a Los Angeles based painter working in abstraction. Today I get to sit down with Chris and have a really interesting conversation about his use of the mark and his relationship to that mark. Chris is also uh, my former professor and he is the one that set me on the path of actually pursuing contemporary art. Um, I wasn't quite sure what I was going to do before that, so I'm very lucky that I ended up in Chris Truman's class, um, and he's always a pleasure to talk to. So uh, we are going to have today's conversation in the chair, and I will see you all on the other side. Chris, thank you so much for joining me. Um, how are you doing? How are you holding up in quarantine? I, I'm doing pretty good. Uh, you know, it, it, it's taken some adjustment, and, um, you know, I, you know, it's funny because when I was... When I was first coming out of grad school, I was a real studio rat. You know, mm -hmm. like I was, I was just always in the studio, um, and maybe even, maybe even too much. You know, like I, I probably needed to get out of the studio and go see people and do things. And then, um, and then, you know, the last couple of years, you know, probably the last I don't know, five or so years, um, through a lot of effort, I've been much more proactive in like, you know, getting out there and, you know, going doing studio visits and meeting with people and. Um, you know, participating in the art world, which I think is super important. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and so now I, it, I came kind of like forced back into my original mode of studio rat. Um, and so part of it is just gets comfortable and natural. And then the other part of it is like, oh, I've got to find a way to keep up with the rest of the stuff and, you know, you know, make sure that I'm communicating with my artist friends and peers because, um, you know, I, like, I, you know, I miss being a part of that as well. Right. Yeah, and you know, um, just thinking of the current moment, we're sort of in this liminal space right now um, between like, you know, before the pandemic and whatever comes next in the new normal. And, yeah. um, you know, you just did an online show with Nava Contemporary. And I'm wondering, you know, in this age of online exhibitions and virtual viewing rooms, uh, how do you feel about your work being mediated digitally? I, I do think that work in general needs to be experienced in person. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm also, you know, the last number of years, I've really been thinking about, like, what it, what it means to be uh, an object, uh, you know, it, it relative to it being an image. And mm -hmm. acknowledging that my audience, you know, at this point with social media and with other, um, you know, uh, outlets, uh, my digitized um you know mediated presence is, is way way larger than my physical presence uh so mm -hmm. the number of people that i could get through a show like a, a physical show it's you know say in la um is relatively small compared to the amount of people that i that i can reach in a week on mm -hmm. instagram yeah and i think that your work your work really deals with the screen in an interesting way mm -hmm. because if you experience them in person you can see this really unreal amount of depth that occurs on this entirely flat surface. Mm -hmm. um, and it, they really explore the tension between the materiality, the physicality of the paint, and then the, the aesthetics of digital imagery. Yeah. And I, I'm wondering if that tension reveals sort of an ambivalence towards the digital world um, or a complicated relationship. Uh, yeah, I mean, it does a, a little bit. Um, I, I'm, I'm not necessarily ambivalent about the digital world. Um, I, you know, I, it, my double major at the San Francisco Art Institute in undergrad was uh, digital media. Mm -hmm. um, and so at that time, I was making uh, digital videos. And one of my professors said, um, hey, Chris, you know, your, your videos are, are, are cool, but they don't look like digital media. They look like painting, you know, and so... He said, you know, I think you're, I think you're still painting uh, because that's where I started out. Uh, you're just using a different format, a different output for it. Um, and I started thinking about that a lot. And then, you know, in the years after, I ended up going back to painting, but with that sort of mindset in mind, thinking, you know, instead of taking old ideas and, and plugging them into a new media, you know, what if I take new ideas and plug them into an old media? And so that's, that's kind of, you know, where I started off with uh, making work that is, um, you know, related to and influenced by, by digital media, 
uh, mediation and social media and, uh, and, you know, screens, for lack of a better word. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and your works really begin in this very sort of gestural, painterly way, mm -hmm. um, sort of abstract expressionist type um, mark making that is then thodically erased throughout the piece, um, throughout the working of the piece. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm wondering what the, what the gesture is, what the intention is um, by erasing your hand, you know, erasing the, the process and hiding that. Yeah, so it's, it's interesting. Um, when I was in grad school, um, I used to go over to Carl Benjamin's uh, studio, um, the hard edge painter. Um, and, uh, and he used to pull out paintings uh, for me and, and walk me through the process. And he had this kind of ethos and this, this um, um, intention that he, he was more or less like a robot. You know, he would set up the system and, he, he, and come up with a pattern or whatever he was going to paint. And then when it came to enacting it, it was his job to keep his own ego and his own attitude out of it. You know, he was just the operator at that point. Mm -hmm. And it was very uh, contrary to um, the thinking of, of the East Coast, you know, the abstract expressionists and the people who are making paintings that, um, you know, he felt were very ego filled, um, it, you know, self aggrandized painters, um, you know, where the stroke was essentially a stand in for the signature. Um, mm -hmm. And he was going about it in this opposite way. And, um, and so I started thinking about what a, what a stroke or what a, a mark uh, represents when you, when you make it as a painter. Um, and I thought, you know, it would be interesting if I could keep that sort of kind of blue collar kind of ethos that Carl Benjamin had, uh, but not necessarily use it to create geometric forms or, um, you know, or something that's much more mechanical. That's, you know, what if I can make something that is, um, that is seemingly organic uh, but also kind of carries this um, depersonalized um, uh, personality with it. Mm -hmm. Sort of like a, a, like undoing that, uh, the ethos of the genius of abstract expressionism. Yeah, yeah. And I, 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 think, I think in a way, to me, it, 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 you know, I, at least I feel like it, it comes off as more relatable. Um, you know, that it's not, um, you know, it's also like a self-check, you know, that, that I'm not asserting myself as the predominant, you know, a figure within my painting, and even though that's kind of ridiculous because it's, you know, it's just, in the end, it's my painting, right. um, you know, but for, um, for my intent, it's, it's about, you know, about being willing to remove myself, um, to kind of erase myself from that process. Uh, so at the end of the day, you see what used to be there, you know, you see remnants of it, you see the outline, you see the negative space created by it, you see, um, bits and pieces and particles of, of what sort of used to be a signature. Um, but in, through the process, it sort of loses its, um, its sort of uh, thereness. It, it loses its materiality. Mm -hmm. And does that tie in any way to the tension between, you know, digital and analog? Yeah, definitely. I mean, because, you know, digital, um, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting because it, it, something that's digital is, uh, is not necessarily tied to scale or to, um, you know, I mean, it could be output in so many different ways. You know, you could, you could project it as a video, you could, um, you could print it as a, a picture, you could, um, you know, you could just show it on a screen, you, you know, maybe it doesn't need to be shown at all. Maybe it's just uh, a, like a file, mm -hmm. you know, and so the, the status of it as a, as a, as a, as a sort of an object, you know, is, is questionable and sort of mutable. Um, you know, whereas, you know, with painting, uh, at least it starts in, in sort of the real world and it starts in this defined kind of point of view, you know, this defined frame, this defined scale, uh, brushwork is all sort of relative to the artist, you know, like I'm not, I'm not making, you know, little tiny micro marks for the most part, you know, I'm, right. I'm making them at a scale that is sort of human, um, you know, that, that we can recognize the type of brush or the type of, you know, the scale of the, of the mark making that, that I'm doing. So, you know, by sort of starting with this, it kind of, uh, you know, old, old technology, you know, painting, um, and then going through this process where, you know, through the layering and removing and um, building and uh, deconstructing of, of these surfaces, uh, the end result is something that, that has a it's sort of a, a record in the history of what's happened to it, but, it's, but it no longer has the, the physical traits of, um, of the original painting. Right. Yeah, and, and I'm wondering too how that might relate to 
just the sheer number of these that you make. You know, I heard an interesting thing one time, and it says, and it said that um, that a single painting should not carry the burden, uh, you know, of an artist's, um, you know, philosophy. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, so that so that what happens is, is that is that the you, the concept and the thinking and the um, the intellectualizing of of your your body of work um, gets sort of balanced on the the totality of your body of work. You know that it's not. Um, yes, you can you can take a single piece and you can see how it relates to that kind of thinking, um, you know. But that one piece is not holding the whole burden of, of the um, of the um, you know intellectual exercise. Um, right. And so for me, by sort of herding these together, you know, they're they're kind of quasi serial in the fact that it's not one after one. It's 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 sort of like a herd that I'm, you know, I, I pull this one forward and then I kind of push this one forward and, you know, I'm trying to keep my little herd together. Um, and I, as I sort of move through time, those become the uh, the placeholders for the, the kind of mode of thought that I'm working with. Yeah. Yeah, and you were working entirely differently in grad school. You know, I've been lucky enough to see some of these works in your studio, um, but the, the pieces are so physical and the texture is so unreal that it looks like it's been fabricated. Mm -hmm. and, and now you're working with these, the, in this ethic that's like, the, the pieces are incredibly flat um, with an unreal amount of depth. Um, and I'm wondering, what sort of led you to that shift, you know, and, and why are you interested in faking out the viewer? Well, it's interesting because the, the painting behind me is actually um, kind of at the tail end of that thicker painting. And uh, it has about two gallons of paint on it. Um, <laughs> and um, so at the time, I was interested in this idea that, uh, that the painting was in the same space as you, you know, that, um, and so the, the physicality, you know, like where, where it jutted out from the canvas, um, you know, you were occupying the same space, uh, and, and it could be, you know, you could get a, a photo of it or a picture of it, but you, you know, aside from being in the space with it, you would never get the true experience of, um, you know, of, of that actual work without being there. Um, and then I kind of, I kind of went off in a little bit of a tangent where I, I started thinking about sort of the artifice and how, um, you know, like places like Vegas or Disneyland or, um, you know, you, you know, amusement parks where there's sort of like fake rocks or fake plants or fake Eif Eiffel Tower and how, um, you know, in, in, you know, in a certain sense, you know, what if I could take a painting and I could, even though it was real and it was physical and it was made out of a material that you could, you could figure out, you know, you could sort of like look at forensically, um, what if I could make it look like it's fake, you know, like it's not really there, you know, like what, what would the implication of that be? Um, and, um, so I was doing that for a little while, uh, and, and then all of a sudden it just kind of dawned on me, uh, that, you know, I kind of wanted to flip that, um, flip the roles that instead of me trying to create something that was, um, that was sort of, uh, alluding to being fake, even though it was real, I thought, well, what if I can make something that isn't there look like it is there? you know, sort of like have more presence or have more, uh, more like suggest more physicality than it actually has. Um, you know, and I think that that ties into the digital world, you know, trying to find ways of conveying, you know, what physical spaces are like, you know, through a screen, you know, maybe like as the screens progress and as our cameras progress, you know, and maybe the, um, you know, the type of, you know, VR that we're going to be using, uh, you know, the spaces that we're able to portray are going to become more and more real. Um, and so I think in, in, in that line, you know, I'm making paintings now that, you know, people say, oh, I love the texture. And, um, and I'm like, that's great. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I don't think that they realize that if they, they slid their finger down there, uh, it would be com almost completely smooth. You know, right. there's almost no actual physicality. It's all it's all sort of built into the surface. And they're created now on Yupo paper, which mm -hmm. is entirely non-porous. It's very, very flat. Yeah. And um, when you were working before in this, this sort of thick impasto way, you were working on canvas. Um, yeah. and I'm wondering where that shift happened. Was it just in order to create this false texture? Well, I started playing around with Yupo, and um, and what I noticed is that um, is that when I 
when I would sort of scrape paint on it, some of the paint would stick and a lot of the paint would be removed. Uh, and um, in fact, I, a lot of people who are, are just starting out with UPO get really frustrated because when they, they're used to painting and they're used to painting on like a you know, gesso canvas and the paint sticks and you know, what you paint stays there. You know, whereas with UPO, um, you kind of have to get used to the idea that it, it at least at first wants to resist what you're doing to it. Um, mm -hmm. and, um, and so I, I started developing these, uh, these techniques that I was doing. And what I realized is that I could make paintings that start to take on um, this really unusual depth that just isn't, it just isn't there. You know, the, just the way that the, the paint scrapes onto this uh, silky surface, um, it leaves a mark that um, is crisp and, and it's, it's, it's much more defined and it's much more um, sort of translucent than, than I've been able to achieve on canvas. Um, so I started just kind of pushing that and seeing how far I could go. And at this point, I've, you know, I've been working on it for probably about five years and I've really developed a set of tools and a working process that, um, you know, that it is really expanded from here. Yeah, I, I wanna share my screen so I can um, show some of these works on UFO. So let me do that. Yeah, so, you know, this, like the piece that, um, like the one that is up right now, um, it's, you know, I was thinking about this idea that the strokes could be potentially these kind of free flowing, uh, like single objects themselves uh, floating in, in kind of like a sea of space um, and where they become dislocated from their sort of natural habitat of a, of a canvas or of, of a painting. And they almost become something, you know, it's almost like a still or like a photograph of like a moment in time of these strokes. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so I'm thinking about like, what does it mean that the strokes are, are there or not there or are partially removed. Um, and, and what, you know, for me, uh, that ties a little bit into the, um, you know, the idea that the stroke is essentially a signature from the artist. It's, it's the way that we embed our own hand into work. Uh, it's, it's the way that we move. It's the way that we, um, that we move our body in order to make a certain, you know, type of mark on a surface. So are you attempting to sort of anthropomorphize the mark itself? Yeah, in a, in a way. I mean, I, I wasn't necessarily turning them into, you know, um, you know, animals or, you know, people or anything, but, uh, but definitely to kind of give them their own sort of space and territory um, and to kind of consider them in a different way. Um, you know, tr traditionally speaking, strokes were combined to build up to something else. You know, they were just building blocks. Um, and I wanted to take those sort of building blocks and, and let those speak for themselves, uh, you know, in, in this regard. Mm -hmm. And can you tell me more about your use of spray paint in these? I mean, there, there's sort of like this industrial urban element that I think is interesting. Yeah, so, um, you know, so I started playing around with spray paint around the time that I started playing around with, with UFO. And it turned out to be a really interesting combination because um, spray is already already a sort of a pixel, you know, it's already digitized to, to a certain degree, I mean, or appears digitized uh, to a certain degree, um, because it comes out in particulate. And, um, and so what I, what I was playing with was um, the combination of the, the spray and then the, the UPO, which are also had this sort of unique surface, there was a, a sharpness uh, that, you know, that happened sort of between these two um, layers. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing that I found is that it was really easy for me to apply, uh, you know, pigment or paint around a mark, um, which could then be removed using spray paint. So, um, so that's kind of where the the sort of the negative mark started to come in. Was this idea that you know if I lay down a mark and then I spray around it, and then I you know maybe you know I could spritz it with water, I could do other things to it, but and then I squeegee the whole thing off that you know what ends up happening is is that the negative ends up becoming the positive you know and i can build a painting through this process of addition and subtraction of the um of the sort of fundamental building block mm -hmm. yeah this i think is a good example of that yeah yeah definitely that one uh the underlying layer and, and sort of the um uh, the the origin of that piece it was uh i i created a silk screen 
and I, well, I actually created two silk screens uh, with this with this patterning that, um, and I and I and I started working with it, and I said, okay, I'm going to take these two patterns, and I'm going to silk screen them onto uh, Upo. Um, you know, uh, Todd from Pressworks helped me uh, uh, do that, mm -hmm. and. Um, and uh, those are going to be the starting point for a whole lot of pieces, uh, like a whole series of work. And everything is going to go back to those to those screens. So, in the same sense of like a Photoshop uh, image, you know, you can you can save a Photoshop image, and then you can do a little work on it, and then save another, and then do a little work and save another. And you can have incarnations that all sort of go boil back down to that one that one single image. And so I was thinking about the idea that they all have this sort of common origin, you know, and it, you know, doesn't sort of hurt that it kind of has a fingerprinty kind of, uh, you know, appearance to it, uh, that those are sort of their, you know, the kind of DNA. And then from there, you know, each one get, I push off that and it, and it turns into an individual piece. Um, so the one that we're looking at now, uh, if you were to break it down, it actually has, um, it actually has four silk screens on it to create this, the background. Wow. Uh, so the, the four silk screens were done in sort of a quadrant. Um, and then, yeah, and then what you can do is, um, and I was able to paint on top of that. And, um, and I believe on this one, it was a clear silk screen. So it was a white, like a white on white silk screen. Mm -hmm. um, and the way that the pattern is revealed is through the way that the paint sticks on the UPO versus the, the the paint that sticks to the part that's silk screened. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, so even then, it's you know the pattern isn't necessarily apparent other than the sheen, uh, but it ends up coming out in the uh, in the way that it's uh, painted. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and speaking of fabrication, I'm just looking at this mark here, and because I've been able to watch you work, I know that. Oftentimes these these marks that look very gestural and sort of as though they've been swiped across the canvas is is fabricated. You you faked that gesture. Mm -hmm. Um and yeah. it's taken several several marks to create something like this. Um yeah. what what are you thinking about when you're when you're doing something like that? Um well so what a lot of the marks in this in this particular piece um, are the negative marks. So, so instead of actually building up the the mark itself, what I'm actually building is sort of the negative space around it, and I'm mm -hmm. stacking I'm stacking layers of the negative space in order to build the painting. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, if you do that enough times, what it ends up happening is you get this interesting transparency and overlapping that happens um, that suggests that there's a form there but the form is never there it's it, it's actually just the the absence it's the um you know the it's the surrounding background area that we're actually looking at mm -hmm. yeah i just want to visit artsy as well and see what you've got on here oh this one I think I'm attracted to the darker ones, obviously. <laughs> yeah, it seems so. <laughs> this one is, oh, this one is so beautiful. And 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 it, some of them get really grimy, too, yeah. which I think is sort of antagonizing the, the crisp uh, quality of the digital, you know, space. Yeah, definitely. Well, there's also this dialogue, uh, sort of by virtue of it being spray paint, um, that, uh, that, you know, enters... Um, you know, graffiti into the kind of equation. And although I'm not, a, I'm not, and I've never have been a graffiti artist, um, I've always been attracted to these spaces that were, you know, public spaces where there was some sort of a, um, you know, a graffiti, a, a, a tag or something. Um, and then somebody buffed it and then somebody painted over that and then somebody buffed it. And, and so there, what ends up happening over time is it, is that the end product is sort of a record of this battle between public and private space, um, you know? And so, in my own work, it, it kind of, I'm I'm kind of thinking about that as well. I'm thinking about the sort of origins and history of abstract painting relative to my own work, and then how nuances of technology, digitization, you know, uh, spray paint, and graffiti, and and the materiality, like how those things conflict with the way that I'm, um, you know, that I'm building and and uh, and I'm sort of expanding this uh, field of work. And that even ties in with the the mark as this signature as of the artist, you know, mm -hmm. and, and that being erased and, and graffitied over, yeah. um, which I think is an interesting addition to the work. 
Um, yeah, so in some of these, there's this feeling that there's a, um, you know, that part of, that there was something that was there in, in a much more complete form uh, that's been removed or that's been um, altered or destroyed or, or sort of fallen apart. Um, you know, but the, there's enough of a suggestion of that being there. Um, it, you know, at the same time, I'm also building these really dense, complex spaces where you're not quite sure, you know, they're, they're not constructed in, a, in, in the normal um, way that you would build a painting, uh, you know, where there would be, you know, a bottom layer and then you would layer a little bit more and, and you can see the paint build up as you go. You know, on something like this, it's like there is no paint build up at all. You know, there's just, there's just a bunch of, uh, different types of um, of mark making on a on a flat plane that end up coalescing into an overall picture mm -hmm. wow yeah i'm just taking this one in that one's in my living room right now <laughs> <laughs> is it <laughs> That's nice thing about being an artist is you get to borrow the work <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I need to show some of the brighter ones because I have been obviously, here we go. That's a more recent piece, um, you know, for sure. Uh, I, I, in terms of color, um, there's, there are a couple things that I'm thinking about. Um, the first is that I, I never really want to stay true to any particular color system. You mm -hmm. know, part of it's a personal preference, you know, that I, I just don't want to, um, you know, I, I don't want to be identified with a particular uh, color palette. But the other part too is that, um, you know, the digital world is is dense in terms of color. It's very rich and it's very, uh, you know, I mean, screens are very attractive, you know, in terms of the light projection and the color. Uh, mm -hmm. And so that's also a reference is, is this sort of artificial color versus, you know, in the areas of uh, much more organic color, this suggestion of, of sort of flat space versus, um, you know, a kind of a deeper, more ambient space as well. Yeah. Oh, wow. The approach to the color here is really, this is, I have never seen this one here. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's a fairly recent piece. Um, but yeah, I'm definitely dealing with this kind of like ephemeral kind of electronic, you know, kind of ambient light. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, some of, some, some of the effects that you might see in, you know, the, the screen or digital space. Yeah, and the mark making here looks really different than mm -hmm. your, your normal mark making. I mean, were you thinking about something different? Was that just a, a sort of natural shift? I, I don't think I was necessarily, well, you know, I mean, I, I had an approach that, you know, I wanted these kind of snaking kind of like uh, circular forms in it. Um, you know, but part of it too is, uh, is you know, it, is trying to keep myself from, like even like imitating myself, you know, like mm -hmm. like keep my my hand and my marks from appearing to be kind of standard moves that I make, um, you know, and so that so that means changing things up, you know, in terms of like a, you know the color, and then it also means uh, you know the mark making, um, you know, it's it's sort of a way of getting outside of that. Yeah, which even I think again relates to sort of keeping the hand of the artist separate from mm -hmm. the work. Yeah. Oh, look at this one. Wow. That's stunning. Yeah, so with this one, you know, I, I, I wish we could get a, um, you know, a really good close up, but there's a, it's, the surface of it is just so, um, like, specific, it's so precise. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, it, there's all these, you know, it, it, from a distance, it looks like it kind of melts together. Um, but up close, you can see there's there are a million little tiny tiny edges and forms and layers and um, densities that are all sort of coming into play with each other. Um, you know, it's a, it's got a very crunchy surface. Yeah, that one's stunning. So you did this show with Nava Contemporary, mm -hmm. and this is an entirely online exhibition, correct? Yeah, yeah, definitely. And this can be seen on Artsy. Yeah, so it's 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 posted on Artsy, um, and you know part of the thinking behind it was, um, you know, I mean there there are individual peculiarities about my work, you know, being referencing digitized imagery, uh, and then there's also the current situation that we're in with the you know virus, and and the desire to the desire to share the work, you know, to, to get the work out of the studio and into the the real world in some fashion. Um, and also the fact that 
um, that in, in, in regular life, you know, um, like I said earlier, more people will see the work, you know, via social media and online than will ever see it in person anyways. Um, you know, and it's not a detractor for the, for the work in person. It's just, it's just an acknowledgement that that's just the way that we're taking in information at this point, at this point. Right. And, and I just want to end by talking about, you know, how you feel the pandemic and the, this shift to sort of online spaces is going to affect the art world in general, or do you sense a shift happening at all? Oh yeah, it's, I, I sense a I sense a major shift. Um, one thing that I that I like and that I've that I've um, appreciated is that um, I think that one of the things that was sort of the first to go is the uh, is the kind of the um, polish and shine from a lot of um, a lot of digital presentation. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the like really like um, high production films or really. Um, you know, like kind of over digitized imagery and um, that kind of stuff that, uh, you know, I think a lot of people are doing things in their living room and, and even like late night, you know, television and, and Colbert and stuff like that, you know, yeah. they're doing it in their living room and there'll be like, you know, a sun walking by and, you know, and I, and so I, I think that in a way that, you know, I like the fact that I, I it's relatable that it that it, you get the sense that you know like you, you're all sort of in the same situation and you're finding ways to deal with it and to address that um, and I, I think that that's really interesting um, and I also think that it, you know it it kind of questions like you know okay how much of the how much of the was it overproduced um, you know it, it did become a a you know kind of the big you know the big galleries throwing the big parties. Um, and everybody else trying to keep up, you yeah. Know, and, uh, you know, I think in a way, um, you know, if this doesn't completely knock out some of the some of the galleries, that um, that what it does, it, it somewhat levels the playing field at this point, just at least in terms of getting the information out. All right, everybody, that was the fabulous Chris Truman. Um, I am going to link his Instagram and website down below, just like I always do. Chris always has something fabulous going on. Um, I don't think he ever has a moment where he's not showing. So I'm also gonna link to whatever shows he's got going on when this releases. Um, Thank you so much, Chris, for this amazing conversation. And I will see everyone in a couple weeks on Cad Calls with Kelsey.